Good morning. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen. So, 12 years ago, I had, um, I had written a book on Google advertising and um, built up an audience of people learning how to do that. Like, that's a, you know, that's like an entire profession, okay? And, I mean, it is. It's a profession. And so, the next step when you do something like that is to have a seminar. And so I decided to have a seminar. So uh, the Hyatt Regency O'Hare, I had a seminar and 300 people came. Now, I don't know, I bet there's probably a fair number of people that have gone to seminars like, it would be really cool to do a seminar. It would be really cool to speak at a seminar. Anybody like ever had those kind of feelings? Well, When I was actually in the middle of it, it was like, oh my word, I am like scared to death. Um, I w like my needles were totally in the red. It was way out of my comfort zone. I remember like there's all these people and they're from Australia and they're from the UK and they're from South America and they're from wherever. And um, they all want to talk to me. And, and, and I'm, I remember walking through the hallway like making my way through all these people, trying to go to the restroom, thinking, I wish I was home reading a philosophy book. <laughs> um, and so anyway, you know, you, 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 you do things and they really can stretch your comfort zone sometimes. And I was definitely out of my comfort zone. And one of the things that I felt that I needed to do, um, that I ought to do, was do a spiritual talk on Sunday morning. So it was like Friday, Saturday, Sunday, so on Saturday, I said, okay, so Sunday morning, seminar starts at 9, but I'm going to start talking at 8, and if any of you want to come to Perry's, like, Gen X spirituality, you know, version of the world, come, and if you're not interested in spirituality, and you don't want to hear that from me, then stay in your room and watch Gilligan's Island. And, um, and I, I said this twice. And, uh, and so this was contributing to my anxiety. I have never done this before. Um, never mind done it in front of 300 people. And so I, I remember tossing and turning all night long. I didn't sleep very well. And I remember having a premonition that something was going to go wrong. And, um, and so 8 o'clock comes, and there's 150 people in the room. Like half of them showed up. And so I give this talk that I call Seven Great Lies of Organized Religion. And if you Google Seven Great Lies of Organized Religion, you'll see an email series and you can read it or there, it might be on video, I don't remember. Uh, but anyway, I'm giving this talk. And about 45 minutes into this talk, a guy in the back stands up and he starts yelling at me. And he goes, this is an outrage! I paid good money to come to a Google AdWords seminar, and this is Sunday school. And I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, be quiet. So, I had a bottle of water. I took the lid off. <laughs> I drank my water, and I just looked at him. And the seconds just dragged by. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, all at once, about six people said, it was optional! <laughs> Finish your story, Perry! <laughs> now, the instant he started yelling at me, my fear just went away. Because it was, okay, the thing you have been fearing now happened. You can relax now. <laughs> now, and okay, then, so, so I finished it. And then the rest of the day, I got nothing but respect. In fact, so one guy came up to me and he goes, Perry, he goes, that was the only thing you could have possibly done that would have worked. If you had started arguing with him, 
the whole audience would have sided with him and the whole thing would have fell apart. That was brilliant. <laughs> I'm like, that wasn't really me. Um, and in fact, so um, later that afternoon, um, I had a breakout session that I was doing. Like people could go to different sessions and my session was in this room. And um, so I'm sitting on a stool and I'm chit-chatting and we're talking about different things and we're talking about the heckler and, and stuff like that. And I said, and so these people had all filed in and they were just scattered all over the room and some were in the back and some were in the front. And I said, okay, it's 3.30, let's get started. And everybody moved to the front rows. Now, have any of you ever seen that? I have never seen that happen. Usually it's just like this, right? Most, most rooms are exactly like this. You've got two people in the front row, six people in row two, right? And most of them are in lo like row five, right? They all move to the front. I'm like, what is this? Now, um, what I'm here to talk about today is hearing from God. And the actual reason that I told you that story was because, so that was 2006, um, hearing the Holy Spirit say, be quiet, was not something I was used to. Okay? So like, I grew up in church, my dad was a minister, any kind of this gifts of the Spirit stuff was like, we're not having any of that around here. Just take that somewhere else, okay? And, you know, it, it, it was kind of schizophrenic because they would pray and they would believe that God would direct your actions, but they absolutely insisted that God would never actually tell you anything. Now, the reason for that was because they essentially sort of like worshipped the Bible and they thought if God talked to people, that would be in competition with the Bible, so you can't have that. So that was kind of the thinking. But, um, but, but that's kind of how I grew up. And then, you know, later uh, I went to different churches and then it was like, don't ask, don't tell, but it was still, we, we don't really do this Holy Spirit stuff. And so I was actually pretty new to this sort of thing. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is the, um, the effortful process of learning to hear. Okay, I think it's, well, as far as I can tell, it is the highest value skill that there is. Like, um, in my business work, I talk to people, there's $10 an hour work, like driving to the office supply store, there's $100 an hour work, like solving a problem for a customer, there's $1,000 an hour work, like negotiating something, like, like if you bought a car and you spent, or a house, and you spent an extra 10 minutes or an hour getting the price down $10,000, you made like $100,000 an hour, right? In a manner of speaking, right? So, you know, there's high value work. I, I think learning to listen to God, that's $10,000 an hour work. Now, in any profession, if you're going to do $10,000 an hour work, you're going to have to do a lot of preparation to get to where it's worth a lot, right? It's like that old story about, you know, some guy comes into the factory and fixes a problem and he bills them for $10,000 and it's like, and, and all he did was like bang a hammer on a pipe, right? It's like, well, okay, it's $1 for banging the hammer on a pipe and $9,999 for knowing where to bang on the pipe, right? So that's, I think, listening to God is, is one of those similar kinds of things. Um, well, so I started paying attention to how do you cultivate this? And I started paying attention to people that I felt knew what they were doing. And I, I'll tell you another story. Um, this was about five years ago. I was running this workshop at my house and I had these four people that had come in and some of them brought their spouses and partners and we were doing a two-day business workshop. 
And we're at dinner, and this guy says, man, I had a really good time today. I had such a good time, I didn't even think about my lawsuit. And I go, lawsuit? He goes, oh, oh I don't want to get into that. And, and he just moved, he clearly didn't want to talk about it. So, so by this time, I had cultivated the habit of starting my day. Um, let's, let's start with what I didn't start my day doing. I was not, st- not starting my day on a phone or a device or an iPad or a computer. I was not starting my day in, in an email box or on social media. Those are the worst possible ways to start your day. And I am serious. I'm totally serious about this. Bad way to start your day. I was starting my day with a notebook and a pen and let's do my best to listen to God and pray and meditate before my day starts. So I was doing that. And so we're doing the second day of the workshop. And I said, I write in my notebook, so what should I talk about today? And what comes back, and I'm just writing this as it comes, ask the, ask the guy about his lawsuit and talk to him about forgiveness and inner healing. Okay, so I write that down. Everybody shows up at 9, and we're doing the housekeeping stuff, and it's 9.20, we're about to get started. I go, oh, I'm supposed to ask you about your lawsuit. Tell me about your lawsuit. He's like, oh. And he goes, well... Um, there's this employee and she doesn't work for me anymore but while she worked for me she claims there was this incident and there wasn't an incident but nobody was there to see it so it's her word against mine and this has been dragging on for two years and I really hope this thing doesn't go to court because anything could happen if it goes in, in front of a jury and it's just been stressing me out for two years and I said okay so um, I, I talked to him about how in inner healing work and sozo sessions and stuff like that, that a lot of times financial breakthroughs are happen when we forgive people. And I said, I, I want to ask you to do something um, really counterintuitive. So, you know, this lady's trying to strangle you. I would like you, he's sitting there with his wife, I would like you to ask God to bless this woman in her life and just kind of make a uh, like a statement in your heart of I forgive you I release you you owe me nothing and his wife and him they kind of look at me like okay yeah I kind of get it I'm like okay good and just then his phone buzzes, and it's 9.24. So this conversation started at 9.20, and now it's 9.24. His phone buzzes, and he goes, it's my attorney. He wants me to call. And I go, it's good news. And his wife goes, it's never good news when that guy calls. <laughs> so it's good news. Take the call. He leaves the room. He comes back 10 minutes later. He goes, she wants to settle. And she's willing to settle for $10,000 less than I decided I would be willing to pay two weeks ago. And he wrote a $120,000 check, and it was over. Just like that. Okay? So, I say hearing God is a $10,000 an hour skill. And if you're not in business, okay, maybe we're... Maybe you don't have to attach money to it. Maybe that's just a way of uh, kind of a metaphor, let's say. But it's a valuable skill. So, so how do you cultivate it? Well, let's, let's, first let's, get it, let's talk about an elephant in the room. My experience is that even in the best, most sanctimonious church, there's always 10% of the people in the room that think this is really BS. And I'm just going to acknowledge it. In all likelihood, there are people in this room that are like, okay, I've seen these 
you know, woo woo, hippy dippy people. And they have their little film trailers about people getting healed. And they have their prophetic words. And I just think they're making it all up. And they're really, they're really nice people. And they're really sincere. And they're not bad. But they're just bat, blah, blah, crazy. Okay? All right. So if you think that, then let's just get it on the table that you think that. I'm not afraid of you thinking that. Okay? I'm an electrical engineer. I like to deal with really precise things. There's hardly anything, there's hardly any, any discipline in science that's more precise than electrical engineering. So I get it. And when you go over into this mystical world, it's like totally different. And it's ambiguous. There's a lot of ambiguity. Okay? Well, so we're acknowledging that. And if you're going to hear God, you're going to deal with ambiguity. Okay? And in fact, the older you get and the more mature you are and the, the more mileage you get on you, the more comfortable with ambiguity you're going to become and you're going to need to be. Because the more situations you deal with and the more crazy family members you have or whatever, <laughs> like, or the more jobs that you work at, you're going to deal with a lot of really weird gray areas and things where there is no exact answer. Okay? And the ambiguity zone is where I find that God meets you. So, um, I, I had my first prophetic experience in 2003 and I told that story like a month ago and it's on the e it's in the email threads if, if for father's house I'm not going to retell that story but it really got my attention it really got my attention and then and then little by little by little there started being other things I went to a prophetic conference in 2005 and um, these people were from Ontario and they didn't know any of us. And they had this thing at the end where all these people lined up and they got prophetic words. And I'm watching and listening as they just go one by one through all these people. And I'm like, they are reading these people's mail. Like, I know these people. And they are hitting this, like, right on. And then it was my turn, and this lady prophesied over me for 12 minutes. And it was like she was, like, hitting, like... 400 yard hole in ones like over and over and over and it was uncanny and I'll never forget um, the palpable sensation of the Holy Spirit in the room and so I got really curious about this and it was like how do they do this like, did they just get beamed like Star Trek off of some planet somewhere and show up and start doing this? But if you started listening to the stories, what you would hear was a long road of learning the art of listening. And I, I remember this one time um, where our pastor said, hey, everybody, we're going to try prophetic words. I'd never done this before. And it's like, okay, so, and, and, and he, he was in my little group, and it was me and some other guy who I didn't know, and, and the pastor. It was just us, us three people. And Dave's like, like, okay, Perry, go. Head goes into sales mode. Like, in sales, you always listen first and talk second. You always ask questions before you start making statements. It's like, he's asking me to sit and like, read this guy's, like, how do I even do that? And I kind of stammered out something that may or may not have made any sense. Um, you know, they, and, and Dave's like, okay, so did that make any sense? And the guy's like, yeah, sort of. And I'm like, 
I have no idea, okay? But I'm really com uncomfortable just sitting there making this stuff up. Okay? Well, maybe a year later, I went to this uh, conference in on Ontario, and the same, same people I mentioned a few minutes ago were, were running this conference, and they did this exercise. It was like, there, there's people from all over the place, including our church, and um, there must have been like 100 people in the room, and they had everybody write their name on a piece of paper, fold it in half, put it in a hat, and then everybody took a name out of the hat, did not open the paper, and, and, and so then she gave instructions. I want you to listen very carefully what she said because it, it's, it's very useful. She said, um, I want you to ask God to give you something for that person and then start writing. Do not edit, do not question, do not anything. Whatever comes into your head, write it down. And, and I'm feeling like, this is crazy. Like, how could this ever work? But I listened to her, and I tried to do it. So I took the piece of paper, and I, okay, God, give me something for, for this person. And I had this memory of walking into a restaurant on the East Coast that I was at once and going up the stairs, and so I just went with it. Okay, so... And I, so I write, I walk up the stairs, and then, and I, I'm writing it as it's coming, like I'm not waiting for it to make any sense. <laughs> this is very important. And I get to the top, and there is a table, and a skylight, and a woman is, a blonde woman is writing in the notebook, and she's very, very sad. And God is saying, yeah, I know. I know. And then, like, it was done. So, okay. So, we put our thing in a hat. And I write my name on it. And 15 minutes later, this woman comes up, and she goes, did you write this? And I go, yeah. She goes, this is every single morning for the last five years in my prayer time. I moved here from the UK. I miss my family. I miss my dad. And this is exactly right. I'm like, I did that? Like, I didn't even have a sales interview with her. <laughs> and... And, and so I, I started to learn how to listen. So, okay. Did anybody have anything show up that surprised you? I'm not going to ask you to come to the front and talk about it, but I'm, did anybody have like, whoo, that was interesting. Got a few, few hands going up there. Um, how many of you, like, this was useful or this was instructive, this little exercise we did? Um, I would like to challenge you, st start your day doing this for 20 minutes and see what happens after a week. Now, in my business community that I run, um, it's a you know it's not a Christian ministry. It's you know nothing like that. Um, lots and lots. M most people are non Christians, but um, we we have some programs where we get people doing something sort of like this: free writing, journaling, and just meditating praying, like whatever, whatever word works for you for 20 minutes every day. And I have lots of people say, they'll say this, it doesn't matter if they're Christians or not. If I do my renaissance time in the morning, that's what we call it, my day goes well. If I skip it, my day goes to crap. Try it for a week, okay? And this is not a guilt 
like a guilt thing about, oh, I got to do my Bible study. No, no, like this is your free, open, creative space. This is where you listen to the muse. And you got 20 minutes before the onslaught of everything begins. And get yourself centered and get yourself situated and do it. Try it and see what happens. Try it for a week. I want to hear from you. Um, Now, there's, there's something that I've found very helpful in doing this sort of thing, which is, here, here's a really good way to start. So, like you can, you can take a little piece of scripture or a story or something like that and kind of use it as a seed, but let me add something else to make it work even better. When you do this, go back in your mind to a, how should we call it, a spiritual experience that you had at some time in the past. Like if I said to you, what's the closest you ever felt to God? And, and, you know, it might be the day you visited the Grand Canyon, or it might be when your baby was born, or, or something, okay, whatever it was. So go back into that moment and anchor yourself and then start there. That usually helps a lot because that was a real thing that happened to you. That was a real encounter and you can go back to it. It becomes what I like to call a thin place in your life, a place where heaven and earth are close together and then you start there. You don't have to start from scratch. You don't have to start from, man, I'm in this crummy apartment and you know no like go 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 to where you feel inspired and then do it now another another thing that i find is almost universal to people learning to hear the voice of god is journeys through the desert um it really jumped out at me the other day how intentional um, the Gospels are when they say over and over and over, Jesus went to a lonely place to pray. Now, I think that this is both physical and experiential. My experience is that the Holy Spirit doesn't hang out in tame, safe places. The Holy Spirit hangs out in dangerous and lonely places. I think the reason I heard the Holy Spirit that day at my seminar when I wasn't used to hearing it very often was I was taking a huge risk. And I think one of the biggest places where where people cultivate their listening ear is in deserts. Um, Nate and Laura each went through a massive desert 10 years ago and I had a front row seat to the whole thing and I can tell you their ability to hear has everything to do with that desert that they went through. And a lot of you know their story and I like don't have to get into it. I went through a huge desert during the last 10 years. Well, what was that all about? Well, gee, how about let's take a midlife crisis some depression, some spiritual abuse, some emotional abuse, some marriage problems, and two adoptions. Just throw them in a stir fry and let your imagination fill in the rest. But I had some pretty lonely, pretty desolate stretches where I wasn't hearing anything. And that will do one of two things. It will either break you and leave you bitter or it will polish you up and turn you into a functioning, practical saint. Um, There's a verse in... uh, 
There's a verse in Hebrews that I think is very important and very interesting, and this is something that not very many people want to talk about. So like, in the charismatic side of the Christian world, there's all the happy, happy, joy, joy, and God wants you to be prosperous and successful and all this stuff. Okay, okay, I do believe that in a wide sense, in a very multidimensional sense, God does want us to be prosperous and successful. Okay, but, but you, you, there, like, there's a process, okay? Hebrews 12, 5, and 6. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. That'll, that'll get the masses and throngs coming to the door, right? <laughs> Scourgings, 25 cents. <laughs> well, but the fact is, you know what? I don't care who you are or where you come from or what country you live in or what religion you are, you're going to suffer. Okay? And... I don't know anybody who's gotten a free ride. Okay? And what I find, the the people that I can observe that God enters into their journey are the ones who willingly take on the big challenges. And they willingly take on the desert. And I've always had this theory... If you take on the desert, the desert doesn't have to come looking for you. I don't know if that's really true or not, but that's kind of how I roll. That's it's like, okay, bring it on. Then God doesn't have to conk me on the head with a two-by-four and get my attention. Um, Last last little um, thing, and then we'll be done. So, when I said, go to your most spiritual moment or the closest you ever felt to God. So... Think of something. Raise your hand when you've thought of something. It only has to be one. It doesn't have to be the very best one. Just pick one. Pick one and raise your hand. Okay. Whatever that is, I, I, want, I, want, I want you to notice some things about it. Maybe... It was an experience of hearing or getting some kind of words. Maybe it was something that you saw. Maybe it was something that you felt physically. Maybe it was a dream that you had or a vision that you had. Maybe maybe you were in nature. Maybe it was some kind of ritualistic Experience. Maybe it was music. Maybe it was having a very deep connection with another person. Um, maybe it was anybody ever read a piece of scripture and had it like leap off the page at you like, and attack you on the face, like a like a pit bull. Um. Whatever that experience was, it probably gives you clues about what your spiritual love languages are. And it probably gives you clues as to where you might find more of those experiences in the future. Because there tends to be patterns. I tend to hear things. That's like probably my number one thing. I also have a huge connection with nature. Nature is hugely helpful for me. I got, kind of got disconnected from that for a long time, but I kind of got it back. Um, Nate, is, Nate is in his best groove when he's in nature. He's got to go kayaking or up mountain hi- climbing or hiking or something. Like twice a year, he'll go bat crazy. So I, I would like you to consider that you, know, you have a spiritual channel language of your own that you can cultivate and it's 
It's actually not that different than cultivating anything else. If you were good at electronics, or if you were good at art, or if you were good at playing the violin, or, or, or whatever, whatever you're good at in the natural world, you, you go, you work on it, you polish it, you practice, right? And, and, and a power becomes a superpower. And your spiritual listening channels are no different. So, um, so I, think, I think that's it. I really appreciate you guys uh, being here today. And if somebody wants prayer or wants to talk about this stuff afterwards, I'm happy to do that. And is there, are there other people as well who are like doing ministry today? Well, if there are, they'll be at the front. How's that? So anyway, <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for your attention today. And, and I, really, I really am serious about that 20-minute thing. Before you do anything, before you text anybody or check your emails or anything, 20 minutes, do what we did this morning and come back in a week and tell me if your life is different. Thank you.